Job 13, uh, verse 24. Job chapter 13, verse 24. The hidden one. Job asks God a question. He says, why do you hide your face? You consider me your enemy. But that's the first part. Why do you hide your face? Job 34, verse 29. Job 9, verse 11. 9, verse 11 says, When he passes me, I cannot see him. When he goes by, I can't perceive him. There are mysteries of God that are hidden. And Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah put it in very good words. He said it exactly, I think, the way many of us might say it. Isaiah 45, verse 15. He says, truly, you are God who hides himself, O God and Savior of Israel. So, there's a mystery here. Isaiah, who had seen the Lord, look back a few chapters, in Isaiah chapter 6, he had seen the Lord, seen him in fact enthroned on the, pra on the, on the praises of his people. He saw the robe that fills the temple. And the same Isaiah comes one point and he says, truly, truly you are a God that hides yourself. And we see this with, with not just God the Father, we see it with God the Son. We see it with God the Holy Spirit. Matthew 11, 25, Matthew 13, 33, Matthew 13, 44 speaks about these things that have been hidden for years. They've been hidden from those who can know and who can see and they've been reserved and hidden for babes. One day I asked God an interesting question. I said, we were learning in Sunday school and we were told God is three things. He's omnipotent, all-powerful, He's omnipresent, he's everywhere, he's omniscient, he knows everything. And then the next Sunday we were taught about prayer, and prayer, seeking God. And so I had, there was a conflict there. If God is omnipresent, if he is everywhere, then why should we seek him? In the tabernacle, there was a veil. So God answered me one day. He said, you know, we know the story when Jesus died. And the veil was torn, imagine from somewhere there, from top to bottom. The veil that was right before the Holy of Holies. And God answered me an interesting answer. He said the veil was torn, it was not removed. He could have removed it. It was torn. Because they still, we are still required to part the veil and come in. The veil was the last barrier between the Holy Place and the Holy of Holies. The veil hid the dimension of glory. You know, it's a year of grace and glory. Exodus 26, 33. The veil kept the holy place separate from the holy of holies, where the ark of the covenant was. Exodus 25, verse 10 to 22. You see something happening. God says to Moses, there inside the holy of holies, between the cherubims at the ark, that's where I'll speak to you. Now God will speak to you from wherever. But there are things God will never say to you until you come to the Holy of Holies, before the ark, between the cherubims. What am I saying? I'm saying they are hidden mysteries of God. And it's a sad thing for us. We were waiting for this bridegroom. Imagine the bridegroom coming and you don't know anything about him. You don't know what he likes, you don't know. You're just getting married. You've not known him. There's a principle in the kingdom, and I think I've said this probably before, where we become what we behold. There's a transformation in the beholding. So this was a custom of Moses, to behold the glory. This glory was hidden from the whole nation. Nobody else in the entire planet experienced the mysteries of God that Moses was experiencing. And he began to be transformed in the same likeness. Exodus 34, verse 29. The verse that says, In the presence of the Lord there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there, at his right hand, at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. There are delights in the spirit that are hidden. 
The glory hidden behind the veil remains behind the veil. God doesn't expose it. He doesn't flamboyantly put it for everyone to see. It is sought. Glory is his nature. And there's a year of grace and glory, so I'm sure you'll hear a lot about glory. But the glory of God is his nature. Do you know there are facets, there are aspects, there are characters, there are attributes of this God that are hidden, that are secret. And that's why the Father calls us to the secret place where secrets stop being secrets and secrets become truth. Psalms 42 verse 7 says, Deep calls unto deep. When Jesus died, the veil was torn. And that signified that now the priesthood that came in under the covenant of grace was being allowed to come behind the veil. What was hidden? You know, the only high priest went behind there once a year. But now the veil was torn and Jesus was saying, you as a priesthood now have permission. You can come in behind the veil and discover for yourself what lies behind them. Why does God hide? You know, uh, Isaiah said something interesting. Truly you are God that hides. <laughs> Why does God hide? You know, God is a person. He is an almighty being, but he's a person, and he's careful with himself. We see the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. John 6, 15, John 2, 24, where Jesus says, and Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew their hearts. He's careful. He's careful with himself. He's careful with whom he reveals himself to, and who gets to see his glory. We are all here saying the year of grace and glory. It's possible December to reach. And we start 2018. And you fail to know what we are talking about the whole year. The ark was a symbol of God's glory. It was carried on the shoulders of the priesthood. You know when they crossed the Jordan, the priest was supposed to carry the ark and, uh, and go before Israel. The ark preceded Israel. The glory precedes us. Numbers 10, 33 to 35. Let's read it. So they set out from the mountain of the Lord and traveled for three days. The ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them during those three days to find them a place of rest. The cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. And whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, O Lord, may your enemies be scattered, may your foes flee before you. And whenever I came to rest, he said, Return, O Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. Whenever the glory preceded them, the victory went ahead of them. You can't divorce glory and victory. There is no defeat in glory. Such that even the waters of Jordan, they didn't part because the priests stepped in the water. They parted because they were carrying glory. The waters didn't part when Elijah hit them because he hit them and he was a prophet. They, they parted because this was a man that lived in the glory of God. When I was thinking about that, I thought about the priesthood now. You know the Bible says we are a royal priesthood. We are the priesthood. We are priests in the house of God. Don't you think it's a disaster for us to have empty shoulders? Don't you think it's a tragedy for us to be walking into Jordan without the glory? What do you think would happen? What do you think would happen if, if the priests walked into Jordan without the glory? The waters would have swallowed them. Is what Peter, uh, Paul says to Timothy, having a form of, God, of godliness, denying the power thereof. The priesthood of this church ought not to have empty shoulders. It is the glory of God that parted the waters of Jordan, hither and thither. We know another story of the four lepers. 2 Kings 7, verse 3 to 20. The four lepers who said, you know, we'll die here. Let's just go. 
We stay here, we'll die, we go, we'll die anyway, so let's go. And scripture says their footsteps were amplified, such that the army of Syria said, there's a very huge army coming and we cannot wait for it. You know, you don't wait for glory. <laughs> you don't wait for glory, especially when you're on the wrong side. You don't wait for it. And they said, let's go. We can't handle this. And the four lepers show up in the camp and the camp is empty. And they eat to their field and they go tell Israel there is food. To fulfill the word of the prophet yesterday who said, tomorrow at such a time there will be food for this price. It's the glory that chased the armies of Syria. It's the glory that amplified their steps. When we have the glory of God, our steps stop being just normal steps. They are amplified. <laughs> the glory went before the storm. David uh, did not uh, go to fight Goliath with the armor of the king. He had been offered the best armor in the land. The king's armor was the brightest, the most shiny, the strongest metal, the most polished armor in the whole kingdom. But he said, you know what, I trust my slingshot. It's been with me in the bush. The glory went before the stone in David's sling and dealt with the enemy who mocked the God that David loved. Glory is dangerous. You know, we are, we are, we are desiring glory. We better be on the right side. This scripture is all about glory. One time, glory spoke and said, those who are for God, stand this way. And those who are not for God, stand this way. And glory opened the earth. That's glory. So we better be careful what we ask asking God for and know where to stand to see this glory. I found the best place or the only place to handle glory is in a love affair. That's what I've said. The glory dealt with the enemy who mocked the God that David loved. Outside of love, we can't know glory. John 1. John was known as the as the beloved apostle. He speaks of beholding the glory, seeing it, hearing it, handling it, touching it. Now before we go there, because that's almost the end. I'm almost done. I want to read you an interesting story. First Samuel chapter 4. First Samuel chapter 4. Remember we talked about the ark? How the ark was the symbol of God's glory. Now, the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Afek. I want you to remember where Israel camped. They camped at Ebenezer. When the soldiers returned to camp, this is verse 3, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Because they went to fight and they lost. And they came to a conclusion. They said, Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh that it may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So they went, they sent people to Sheila, they brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the children. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phineas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what is all, shout what is all this shouting? and commotion in the Hebrew camp. When they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were very afraid. A God has come into the camp. This is a Philistine's own confession. A God has come into the camp. We are in trouble. Nothing like this has ever happened before. Woe unto us. These are mere people going for war. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the same God that struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. And then finally, they encouraged themselves. They said, be strong Philistines, be men. <laughs> or you'll be subject to the Hebrews that they have been to you. Be men and fight. Now that's how the enemy also encourages himself. Be men. <laughs> he said, you handle the glory of God. 
That's how demons speak. They say, go up and down. Because demons, no? Powers of darkness, no? This glory is a dangerous thing. And they know what it did to Egypt. So they said, be men, be men and, uh, and fight. Now if scripture ended there, if there was nothing else after that verse, we were not told anything. We can assume Israel won the war and the Philistines lost. Read verse 10. So the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated. And every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of God was captured. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. How? The ark, the one when they carried and went before them, it, it decreed victory. Even before they fought, they had won. Now they brought the very same ark. They have rejoiced because they know. They know the story of this ark. They know what happens when the ark is around. They know God is with them. They know the glory of God is there. They know they can't be defeated. So what happened? I told you the ark of the covenant was kept in the Holy of Holies. I told you there are secrets in the Holy of Holies. I told you there are mysteries behind the veil. So I was having that question in my mind as I read the scripture. And that's where... Uh, Isaiah's question made sense. He said, Lord, why do you hide yourself? Job asked like that. So this is what I imagine God did. They said, we will bring the ark of the covenant from the temple. As it goes before us, there will be victory. We will bring the glory of God from where it is to where we are for our own convenience, for our own comfort, we will not even seek God. We are just interested in the ark. Now there's a glory of God that resides there. So they went. They sent men. Uh, Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phineas, went to pick the ark. And I imagine God doing this. They picked the ark. God hid. And they went with God to the battlefield. And the Philistines said, A God has come into the camp. And they should have won. But during the, the war, God hid because he don't remove his mysteries from the secret place and bring them where they are at your convenience. So God hides, God hides himself. Truly God, you are God that hides yourself. And the war is fought and Israel lost. And the very same ark is captured. That didn't make sense to me. And you know what we could conclude? We could have said God left. No, there was Ichabod when the glory departed. And then the glory didn't depart, the glory was there. Read chapter 5. When they brought the ark now, they carried the ark, they carried the God of Israel. <laughs> and took him to their temple. After the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer. From Ebenezer. I want you to remember that word, Ebenezer. To Ashdod. Then they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and sent it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose up the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and put him back on his place. The following morning when they rose again, Dagon was fallen on his face before the ground. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying in the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple step on the threshold. The Lord's hand was heavy upon the people of Ashdod and his vicinity. He brought devastation upon them and afflicted them with tumors. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us, because his hand is heavy upon us and upon Dagon our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? What does that tell you? God was still there. They took him from the Holy of Holies and he hid. He hid himself and they took him to the, to the wall and he hid. And they lost the wall and the Philistines captured the ark and they still took it to their temple. But you know he was still there. He was still there. Such that when they set him beside their God in the morning, Dagon had fallen. I 
I want you to remember Ebenezer. Ebenezer is thus far from God has brought us. That's Ebenezer. Ebenezer is this far the Lord has brought us. That's why Israel camped. They camped at this far where God had brought them. Glory is a knowing. It's a present continuous reality. If we as a ministry will camp at this far the Lord has brought us, we will not see the glory of God. This far the Lord has brought us and we are grateful. But our eyes are fixed ahead. That's what Paul said. I forget what lies behind and I fix my eyes on what is ahead. I count, consider all things lost for the excellence. He's speaking about the glory. For the excellence of knowing the Son of God. That's the glory of God. And that's why Israel count. They count at the last place of encounter. Please don't count at the last encounter you have with God. Don't camp there. Don't make it your habitation. Advance. The children of Israel are told, you've gone around this mountain too long. Advance. Ebenezer was the last reference point. I said something and I'm about to finish now. I said the, only, the safest place and the only place where we can know the glory of God is in a love affair. How are the hidden things of God made or revealed to us? Because I read that we were talking to Steve and uh, someone said something so profound. He said, God does not hide things from us. He hides things for us. They are for us. They are not hidden so that we will never know them. They are hidden for us. How then do the hidden things that are God's? Because even if we try to remove this glory by force, I end up give you. Let me put it like that. We cannot hijack the glory of God for our lives and, and, and cause it and force it to work. How then? Because this glory is the, the Lord's, but there is a place we come into, into partnership with Him where the glory also works for us. And that place is what I'm calling a love affair. It's intimacy. The day Adam opened his eyes, you know, because God caused him to sleep. The day he opened his eyes and he saw Eve, this was the first thing that came out of his mouth. He said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Until we are the Lord's and he is ours, we have no right to carry what is his. The glory is in towns. It belongs to him. Jesus made a prayer in John 17. And he, this prayer sort of shows us what was happening before the foundations of the earth were laid. Before God said, let there be. No, because God was there. He existed before the foundations of the earth were laid. He, is not, he does not live in eternity. He is eternity himself. And Jesus prays and says, Father, glorify me with the glory we share before the foundations of the earth were laid. Before the beginning of time, God was. And you know the Father, Son, and Spirit were there. And the Father glorified the Son. And the Son gave glory to the Father. And the Spirit glorified the Son. This was what was happening. For eternity passed, until one day God decided, I think we can invite one more person, just one more, one more person to share in whatever we are sharing amongst us. One more person to, to experience what happens here. And then they said, let us make man in our very image, in our very likeness, meaning he can also handle the, the same glory. He can know it, the same way we know it, he can know that glory. Intimacy. His glory becomes ours when we become His. The bride who knows her groom will be glorious. This word know is not just knowing in the head. It's the same word 
that speaks of intimacy, an intimate knowing. Outside of intimacy, we have no right, we have no mandate to carry God's glory. Now I'll finish with an, uh, an illustration. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 13. They call it Song of Solomon, Song of Songs. It's the greatest song ever written. Because for once, it's the bridegroom who sang, not us. Yet our song is this song. Song of Songs 613. Come back, come back, O Shilomite. Come back, come back, that you may gaze on me. These are the friends who are speaking. And then the lover who says, Why would you gaze on the Shilomite as on the dance of Mahanaim? Mahanaim is found in Genesis. It's a camp where Jacob walked into and he met the angels of God and he said, this is my name. This is the camp of God. So this, this bride in Song of Songs is dancing an interesting dance. And the world is watching. They are saying, come back. Come, we want to see. This dance you are dancing, we have never seen it before. We, we want to see. 